The first season of the Halo television series has come and gone. I took my time and have arrived at my final thoughts. Through the course of this video, I will elaborate on the TV show's specific elements which ultimately don't work as a Halo adaptation. I encourage all to approach this video with an open mind as I'm aware there are those who actually enjoy the show, while others, like myself, were ultimately turned off by its poor execution of the Halo franchise's core concepts. I would like to say before we begin, there is no one involved with the creation or production of the Halo TV show I wish ill will toward. The issues I have are exclusively with the writing and execution of the show as it pertains to adapting the Halo game franchise. So don't take this as me personally attacking anyone involved behind the scenes. I can dislike a product without hating the people who made it. To that end, I have to pose this question. How could a group of creatives work so long and hard at adapting something, but almost entirely miss the core of what made the original source so incredible? There seems to have been an agenda or initiative to distance the show from the games as much as possible, in order to allow the creative team behind it the freedom to stretch the boundaries however they see fit. By extension, this would essentially allow them to break the established rules of a universe and retcon anything and everything that hindered their vision with a justifiable excuse. This is also likely why the show was so heavily touted by individuals behind the scenes as existing in the Silver Timeline. Remember everyone, it's perfectly fine to disregard the key components of a franchise and brand, as long as it is in a different timeline. I mean, why wouldn't Halo need to feel and look like Halo in any timeline? And I mean that question seriously. What the heck is the point of adapting something in the first place if all you want to do is tear it apart to form some amalgamated conglomerate of something entirely different? I'm not saying the show had to directly adapt the Halo games as a one-to-one -one translation from game to screen, but I expected the heart and soul of Halo to remain. I was at peace with the decision to change things up here and there. That's to be expected with any adaptation. But I can tell you that whatever the Halo TV show is trying to be, it's not trying to be Halo. It feels like it wants to be anything but Halo. It honestly feels like a random sci-fi story with a coat of Halo paint slapped on top. This idea that there was an effort to have the show distance itself is not imaginary. In fact, it is through the words of those who worked on the show that we know this. Even recently published Schreiber remarked that the show was designed to make viewers, and more importantly, Halo fans, uncomfortable. I'm not sure why trying to make people feel uneasy, needing to make fans uncomfortable, from the start was an actively sought out objective of this TV show. Did they believe it was all in the name of good television? Honestly, I really think the creatives behind this show genuinely thought what they were doing was really good. Well, I intend to show that in trying to change Halo to appease a generic TV narrative, the Halo TV show doesn't work as a good Halo adaptation at all. Let's start by talking about the most important part in all of this, Master Chief. Master Chief is a gaming icon, one of the industry's most recognizable characters, one who has stood his ground for more than 20 years. The legendary status of such a character should be respected, as should the core of what made the character so beloved and iconic to begin with, as it is that core which drove the passion of fans all around the world to connect with him in the first place. The Halo TV show is trying to adapt a franchise and expand it into a new medium, while at the same time, it attempts to follow the overused modern trope of deconstructing a hero character. I can only guess that this was done in hopes of humanizing Master Chief. You know, to make him more relatable. Here's the problem with this direction. It shows the writers behind the show clearly don't understand Master Chief's character. The Chief is more than just a suit of armor, and although it is true that Bungie saw Master Chief as a husk for the player to inhabit. He still was a character, he had a voice, a personality, and even a classic hero's journey. Master Chief is a traditional, larger-than-life hero, who serves as the window into the greater conflict at the heart of Halo's narrative. In the games, Master Chief is one of the last remaining Spartans, super soldiers designed to give Earth and the UNSC an advantage on the battlefield. In the war between humanity and the Covenant, Master Chief acts as a beacon, a symbol which represents 
to some extent the best parts of humanity itself. He embodies the courage, bravery, resilience, determination, hope, and sacrifice of mankind, as well as its will to survive. We are repeatedly shown throughout the game series, through situations of gameplay and story, what Master Chief is willing to go through to protect mankind. This is not only who Chief is, but it is also the first priority for Chief in a war against an alien collective hell-bent on wiping humanity from existence on their path to the Great Journey. The focus of Master Chief in the TV show starts out as a sort of normal Spartan for like half an episode, but almost instantly takes a detour down the road of humanizing himself through a bizarre series of actions. In the show, Spartans have the same background as they do in the lore of the games. That being, they were kidnapped as children and forced into the Spartan program. There, they undergo indoctrination and were pushed through the rigorous tests and experiments via augmentation procedures. This aspect doesn't really change from the background of the game's world, although there is a new addition to the TV show, which is the concept of these inhibitor pellets or chips placed within the Spartans to keep their emotions suppressed. This focus on the Spartans discovering their humanity becomes a major plot thread of the show, with John and Kai both behaving like teenagers going through puberty. They become obsessed with their personal feelings and emotions. Chief's personal problems quickly take priority over everything else. I want to remind you that Halo is a franchise where the entire narrative of the story is focused on a war between humanity and a religious cult of aliens. In this scenario, why is the show focusing on the personal feelings of Earth's greatest warrior while Earth's colonies and people are being slaughtered or glassed in droves? A major subplot of the first season is this conflict of Chief's anger at finding out about his abduction and indoctrination at the behest of the UNSC scientist, Dr. Catherine Halsey. In the games, Master Chief's background and the dark history of the Spartan program barely come up at all. It's always there in the background of the games, and yes, Chief knows about it, but he also knows the past is the past, and that right now, he's fighting for the future. With a conflict large enough to wipe humanity from the face of existence, what importance do petty squabbles with Halsey or UNSC leadership have over the survival of his species? Chief will put humanity's needs ahead of his own regardless of the circumstance, because that's a sacrifice heroes make. The decision made to add more relatability and humanity to Chief weren't even necessary. Chief embodies and symbolizes the best parts of humanity. He doesn't need to be more relatable, because he always was. If he represents the best of ourselves and the universal values that we all aspire to achieve or foster, what more could possibly be needed to make him relatable to the audience? We all wish we could save the day and be the hero. We all want courage when things go bad. We all want to be able to endure the worst and come out stronger. We all want to be steadfast in the face of adversity. These are things which Chief has, does, and is all the time. Chief doesn't have to whine about the injustices done to him as a child for us to care about him. He doesn't have to say everything he's thinking for us to know him. More importantly, he doesn't have to remove his helmet every time he speaks for us to connect with him. We connect with Chief not through his face or his emotional outburst. We connect with him through his actions. Actions speak louder than words. Master Chief is a man of action and a man of few words. When he does speak, his words have impact. The Halo TV show focuses on trying to deconstruct Chief in order to allow newer audiences to understand or relate to him. But in no single episode or part of the series do the writers offer up anything better or more intriguing than the moments inside of the Halo games which resonated with people for the last 20 years. Chief is just as relatable with his helmet on as he is with it off. As a matter of fact, I believe he is more authentic with his helmet being on rather than it being off. Creators on the show and Pablo Schreiber argue that the audience can't get the full range of facial expressions and nuances to the acting performance from an aesthetic point of view. If Master Chief keeps his helmet on, again, this choice was seemingly done because Chief wearing a helmet is somehow unrelatable to an audience. I will illustrate my stance by showing footage of Master Chief from across the Halo games. Radio for Vito. Heavy lift gear. We're not leaving him here. Yeah. 
you're not. Oh, crazy fool. Why do you always jump? One of these days, you're gonna land on something as stubborn as you are. And I don't do bits and pieces. Where is she, Chief? Where's Cortana? Don't make a girl a promise. If you know you can't keep it. She stayed behind. You might be too late. You know me. When I make a promise. You keep it. I do know how to pick them. Lucky me. I'll drop a beacon, but it'll be a while before anyone finds us. Years, even. I miss you. Wake me. When you need me. Our duty, as soldiers, is to protect humanity. Whatever the cost. You say that, like soldiers and humanity are two different things. I mean, soldiers aren't machines. We're just people. I'll let you have the deck to yourself. She said that to me once. About being a machine. You should leave me here with the rest of the carpets. We all fail. We all make mistakes. It's what makes us human. I'm sorry, Chief, but how have you ever failed? I should have protected Cortana. Stopped everything from going wrong. I failed her. I will not fail you. Chief. Wait. We're going to make it. I... We have to. This is all I've got. It's all we need. As you all can clearly see, Master Chief is completely relatable. More than that. His personality shines through perfectly. We know when he's confident, when he's sarcastic, when he has a sense of humor. We know when he's worried and when he's sad. Why do we know this? Because the voice actor Steve Downs delivered an incredible vocal performance. All the nuances of his mood are clearly conveyed to us by the actor. I don't need to see Steve Downs' face to know when he's delivering a line with emotion. I hear it in his voice. Halo isn't the only franchise with a famous, faceless character. Darth Vader wears a helmet throughout almost all of his existence in the original trilogy. We only see his face at the end when Darth Vader dies and Anakin Skywalker re-emerges. Don't try telling me Darth Vader isn't one of cinema's most iconic characters. Furthermore, Hugo Weaving appears faceless throughout V for Vendetta, while playing the title character V, a performance which is probably more captivating by the fact that we don't see his charred human face at all. See, in cases of certain characters, the mask is their face. V's face in V for Vendetta is the Guy Fawkes mask. Darth Vader's face is that helmet, and Master Chief's face is his helmet. That's what he looks like. I've seen Pablo Schreiber and a couple of other things. I know he can act, and I think he's a pretty good fit for Chief. However, a good actor shouldn't have to show his face for us to comprehend or relate to him. And, if you're a writer, and you're adapting Master Chief, and you can't convey the emotions or subtleties of his character without removing his armor, then maybe you shouldn't be adapting Halo. With the Chief, it's all about his subtleties. It's about his posture, gestures, and his tone of voice. That's it. That's as complicated as Master Chief needs to be. And at the end of the day, people of all ages have come to understand these things. If children could understand Master Chief years ago, Audiences can understand him today. That armor is his identity. It's not only what he is, it's who he is. So I ask you all, when did the concept of a hero start to become detached from the concept 
of humanity itself? This is a question the Halo TV show forces me to ask. Because this show doesn't care about why Master Chief is heroic or iconic. It cares about deconstructing that iconic hero, which has nothing to do with the spirit or essence of Halo. One of the most beautiful and human aspects of Chief is his deep bond with Cortana, a platonic love story forged through the flames of war. Chief and Cortana have been through everything together. They trusted one another implicitly. That bond of trust and loyalty, an emotional connection between them, was as human as anything else. In the end, they were willing to do anything for one another. Master Chief essentially braved a trip to Helen back to rescue her aboard the flood-infested city of High Charity. She returned the favor by sacrificing herself for him. Master Chief doesn't need to sleep with a Covenant spy who grew up on a trash planet and got indoctrinated by the Covenant to be relatable or human. If the goal of all this so-called relatability and humanizing Chief for the audience was to make him feel less like the empty super soldier the show's creators thought he was, why did you create a story where his actions and motives feel far emptier and hollower than anything we were shown of him in the games? His relationship with Maki is based on him talking with her a few times, seeing her in a vision, and taking her for a walk on Reach. After that, he supposedly falls in love with her and decides they should hook up? How does any of that make him seem less empty? That doesn't come across as love. It comes across as, like, weird lust. The games give us a wholesome emotional love story based on connection that is founded across three games worth of trials and tribulations. When the peak of their love story arrives in Halo 4, it is earned. It's not superficial. It's beautiful and somewhat tragic. It's human in a very poetic and ironic sense. So how do we get out of here? I'm not coming with you this time. What? Most of me is down there. I only held enough back to get you off the ship. No. That's not... We go together. It's already done. I am not leaving you here. John. I've waited so long to do that. It was my job to take care of you. We were supposed to take care of each other. And we did. Cortana, please. Seriously, what the f*** are you doing? Which of those two love stories is better at humanizing Chief and making him relatable? Yeah, that's what I thought. Pablo Schreiber has implied that since the Halo TV show is a long-form series, these changes to the character are justified because of some unknown, unapparent pay for the character later. Master Chief wouldn't whine about his feelings and how bad things are going for him in the middle of a war. Master Chief wouldn't sleep with an enemy spy regardless of her species' origin. Master Chief in the Halo show is not Chief at all. He's just John, and too many times in the TV series, he places his own issues first. This isn't because that's what he should be doing, it's because that's what the writing of the show says will add drama and tension between characters. Again, I have to hammer this point in. In what world would Chief ever sleep with the enemy's spy, especially after that enemy glassed an entire colony of humans? The ridiculous choices made to try and be edgy or relevant or similar to something other than Halo amount to something that feels 
uninspired, and out of touch. Master Chief is such an incredible character and such a beloved icon to millions of people around the world. Why would anyone want to do anything except honor his legacy instead of trying to pick it apart for such generic narrative reasons? I can't think of a good excuse. Can you? Now, as we've talked about Master Chief, who is the key pillar of the TV show, there are several other things which ultimately didn't work either. The biggest of these being the show's atmosphere. In the Halo games, humanity is shown as the faction fighting against overwhelming odds to ensure its own survival. We are the good guys, while the Covenant are the bad guys. It's a pretty simple setup. Earth good, aliens bad. Whereas the Halo TV series spends an awful lot of its runtime focusing on the inner conflict and political schemes of the various parties involved, most, if not all, of the UNSC leadership are shown in a largely negative light. Given the vast amount of the human story of the show's first season, it is an incredibly negative look at the franchise's good guys. It makes for an awkward time as an audience member. I mean, why should I care? about what happens to humanity or any of these characters if they are all scumbags and manipulative jerks? Who are we, the audience, supposed to root for in this situation? The show assumes we will side with Chief, of course, except that Master Chief is supposed to be the symbol of humanity and represent its spirit and war effort. If Chief represents something the audience has been taught is ugly, cold, and devoid of goodness, I mean, aside from Miranda and Admiral Hood, which human UNSC characters are actually good in this show? Everything the UNSC does is painted with a tinted lens. There's no light or goodness or positivity about the main human faction of the Halo franchise. The Halo games do a great job of focusing on the sacrifices of the UNSC and their struggle to protect mankind. While their conflict with the Insurrectionists does exist in the lore and the background of the games, it does not overshadow the greater and more heroic story of a species fighting for its survival. The military sci-fi elements of Halo are grounded and rooted in a sense of real wars or conflict. Think of the vibe or tone of films like Saving Private Ryan, Black Hawk Down, and We Were Soldiers. Now combine that with the cinematic setup of the Colonial Marines from Aliens. That's Halo. It's a grounded military sci-fi shooter. The Halo rings aren't supernatural, they're technological. The Covenant's great journey is more or less unintended martyrdom. Their war effort is a religious crusade, one which will cause the destruction of the human race. That's what Chief is fighting. That's what humanity cares about. Sadly, the Halo TV series is convinced that the only good drama Halo can offer viewers is a crippling portrait of the UNSC's inner politics. That in an angsty teenager who screams and fusses all the time like a character from some cheesy teenage drama show. Now, some of these political aspects the show dives into could have worked in moderation. Honestly, there were some good ideas at play here, it's just they weren't executed nearly as well as they could have been. I think in isolation, this particular problem of execution was the real factor that hurts some of the show's better ideas. Instead of spending their time developing the audience's connection with humanity and the UNSC, they turn their attention to Quan Ha's insurrectionist stuff and this weird desert monk cult plot. I'm almost convinced someone at CBS or Paramount was dead set on making some part of the show feel like a cross between Star Wars and Dune. Except the writing and dialogue don't feel anywhere near the caliber of those works. Actually, to be honest, the dialogue is quite awkward and feels more like it was written for children or teenagers in mind. This is despite the fact the show often includes gory violence and nudity like an episode of Game of Thrones. Nevertheless, these writing struggles don't help with the tonal problem that this show has. To be clear, it is an issue which is easily avoidable. In the Halo games, it's no secret who or what you're fighting for, nor what Master Chief stands for. A failure of the TV series was making it difficult to connect or sympathize with humanity and their predicament. This shouldn't have been a surprise to people making this. But when you show the humans as the sadistic, power-hungry space fascists, who among your audience is going to care if Master Chief saves the day? The military in the lore of Halo isn't blameless or perfect. 
but the entire franchise is predicated on Earth being the side we root for, while Master Chief tries to dismantle the Covenant and eliminate the Flood. Look at Halo Landfall and We Are ODST. These are fantastic examples of how to showcase the UNSC. They are soldiers fighting a hopeless war and giving their lives to give Earth and its people even a small chance at a future. Not only that, but the grounded and gritty tone of We Are ODST or Halo Landfall are basically perfect. These short films, which acted as marketing, are incredible representations of how well the core values and principles translate to a different medium. I really wish the makers behind the show would have studied these shorts, because as sad as it is to say this, it's true. Halo Landfall does in seven minutes what the TV series failed to do in nine episodes. Capture the spirit and essence of Halo. The lack of that fundamental essence is what derailed the show and why it doesn't work as a Halo adaptation. While I feel it's important to understand why this first season of the TV show fell so far off the rails, I'd like to also make a point of acknowledging that simply saying the show sucks or it's bad aren't really appropriate here. This is largely due to there being so many underlying issues which contribute to the overall failure of the show as an adaptation. Halo is a franchise that for the last 10 years has had a series of pitfalls. If there's one thing I know about the fan base for Halo, it's this. Whenever we are mad about something, we go through a phase of being angry about it like any other fandom. However, unlike many other fandoms, I found Halo to be particularly productive with giving constructive criticism and usable feedback. By outlining the mistakes the TV show made in its first season, my hope is that this video, along with those made by others, can continue that wonderful legacy of constructive feedback. Regardless of what the producers and creators of the show might think, Halo fans don't root for Halo to fail. On the contrary, we hope more than anything else for its success, whether that be a game, a book, or a TV show. It all matters to us. We want to see a Halo TV show be as good as we know it can be, even if it makes a few errors along the way. Why do we force? So that we can learn to pick ourselves up. Whenever Halo stumbles, the fans are there to support it. I'm not expecting them to adhere to every single aspect of the Halo games. With that said, the very least one can expect is to see an adaptation try to capture what its source material was in an essential kind of way. However, I've spoken my piece. Hopefully this will serve as an effective explanation of why the first season of the Halo TV show is a bad adaptation. With that, thank you guys so much for watching. I really appreciate it. It means a lot. If you enjoyed the video, please consider liking, hitting the subscribe button, and clicking that little bell for notifications so you don't miss out on any new videos as soon as they drop. Thanks again, and have yourself a great day.